does a skeleton have a race? Would someone know your race just based on your skeletal structure and your cranial structure? I don't want to erase the grouping. I think the grouping is beautiful. The grouping is diversity, but the hierarchy has got to go. Hi, I'm Danielle Romero, and I'm so glad that you're here with me today on my channel where I've been researching what does it mean to be an American? How different groups that came to America became white. And the reason I've been doing that, if you're new to the channel, is that this whole channel started about a year ago where I was interviewing my family members, trying to understand about my mom's grandmother. My mom's grandmother changed her identity and left the South and moved to New York in the 1930s. It's important to understand the history surrounding our family's story, which is why I'm doing these videos. Let's dive in to the world of the cranium. Because we've been talking about how a lot of ethnic constructs are just that. They're kind of constructs, right? They're people are on a spectrum and we can't just say someone's black or someone's white. But when we're talking about the skeleton, this is a little bit different. So forensic anthropologists in particular have to really dive into this realm. Now, I'm not a person that can hang and listen to true crime podcasts. Uh, let me know if that's something you do. I know some people actually like listen to them to relax. I'm too much of a baby. So this is about as deep as I can go into forensic anthropology. But we need to talk, first of all, that cranial features are not infallible indicators of ancestry. In fact, the most seasoned forensic anthropologists say that only about there's only about 85% accuracy in assessing racial ancestry based on multiple cranial features. Now, I hear a number like 85%, and I think that's really high. Uh, it sounds like a very accurate thing, but it's not 100%. Here's the catch. The less we know about the context surrounding a skull, that is like where it was found and, and things like that, the less accurate the assessments become. So there's a lot of other information that's going into these assessments. So what are the traits that vary between skulls of different racial backgrounds? Does a skeleton have a race? Would someone know your race just based on your skeletal structure and your cranial structure? The influential figure who contributed significantly to the scientific concept of race was Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Now, he put a special emphasis, though, on the study of skulls and reduced diversity of skulls to five main varieties. He was born in Germany, and he made notable strides in comparative anatomy and anthropology, and he left a lasting legacy in this field. He emphasized the unity of humanity and refuted the notion of distinct species or subspecies of humans. But he classified humans into five distinct races based on physical characteristics. And we're talking mostly about the, the cranial characteristics of the skull. Caucasoid, mongoloid, Ethiopian, American, and Malay. However, it's important to note that his classification system was based on superficial features and did not take into account the complexities of genetic diversity or ancestry. The thing that popped up in my mind when I was researching this was, well, at what point of, of mixing between these groups uh, do you get a whole different kind of a skull that doesn't really match either of these? It's just a question that I have. Let's dive in and see what these five skulls look like and let me know what you think. Most of these traits that they're looking at kind of reside in the face or the palate. And these are like subtle clues about a person's ancestral origins. For instance, the shape of the eye orbits, they said, can be indicative of somebody's ancestry. Now, I'm not talking about the shape of the eyes per se, but we're talking about the actual like, orbital bone. And according to this taxonomy, Africans often exhibit a more rectangular shape, while East Asians lean toward a circular configuration, and Europeans tend to sport what could be likened to, they say, aviator glasses, which <laughs> I don't know, it just seemed hilarious to me. Now, down, moving down to the nasal region, they point out further distinctions. Europeans often have a pronounced angulation that divide the nasal floor from the interior surface of the maxilla, while Africans tend to lack such a sharp angulation. Asians, on the other hand, fall somewhere in between. And the nasal bridge often displays variation, which I think this one's a, lot, a little bit easier to see, with, a, with Africans boasting an arching 
shape. Europeans have high nasal bones with a peaked angle, and Asians usually possess low nasal bones with a slight angulation. He goes on to talk about nasal nasal aperture, which is the, the opening of the nostrils. And he said Africans tend to have wider openings. Europeans tend to have more narrow ones. And lastly, they talk about the zygomatic form. We're talking about the cheekbone. Asians tend to have cheekbones that project anteriorly. So like they're going out more. Europeans and Africans have cheekbones that are more lateral, causing it to recede a little bit. Blumenbach mostly stayed scientific when he was doing this, except uh, for one skull he called was uh, that the Caucasian skull of a Georgian female he thought was, quote, most handsome and becoming. So I guess he had an affinity uh, for Georgian females from the Caucasus region. And Blumenbach attributed differences to this human type, such as variation in stature and color, largely to climate. He was his uh, assumption was that people had started from one place and as they spread out, things started evolving depending on what climate they were in and what was necessary or not necessary based on the environment they were living in. And that humans are all born red. So he said color cannot constitute a species or variety. Actually, Blumenbach refuted the notion that Ethiopians were inferior to other races. And he wrote favorably about the quote Negroes in his writing, extolling their beauty, their mental abilities and achievements in literature and other fields. The article continues. And he pointed to variations in opportunity as the cause of differences. I was researching um, some forensic anthropology classwork where they actually, you know, you're, you're learning all of this stuff and you're using this to identify people, right? When we're trying to like piece together clues. So they have exercises where you will have look at um, cranial casts. So they're not real skulls and of people of different ancestries. And with one, and then there's one mystery skull. And you have to carefully examine the features and kind of figure out, okay, which group does the skull belong to? There's something being held in tension here. Because on one hand, um, I know people <laughs> get upset and have been accused of being like uh, a Marxist and a communist for saying that I don't believe people should be called black or white. And that's not me erasing ethnic diversity. I actually feel like it's celebrating that by saying, hey, two groups is not enough to define human beings. Like, let's get rid of those two groups and kind of dive in deeper to our ancestry. But on the other end, you've got this taxonomy of just a handful of, of groups that a person can fit into. And I, I think it's really interesting uh, to look at and say, hey, like, does this, does this really fit? Now, to be completely honest, the idea of measuring skulls and stuff gives me a bad vibe. Really reminds me a lot of what um, was happening in Nazi Germany, you know, where they're measuring skulls and they're making determinations based on someone's intelligence and things like that. And I think there's a fine line between that. I think, um, you know, this is a neutral thing. Like, it, it, it's not bad or good to look at a skull and say, hey, like, can we sort this? You know, I have a four year old and you know, he's learning how to sort and categorize right now. When we're sorting and categorizing, does something have in common? And how can we group things? And it's necessarily a bad thing to group, right? It's kind of inherent to human nature. I think the problem is not the grouping, but the hierarchy that comes from the grouping. And I think that is the problem. I don't want to erase the grouping. I think the grouping is beautiful. The grouping is diversity. But the hierarchy has got to go. This is something you take with a grain of salt. But I still feel like 85% was a pretty high success rate. Let me know what you think. And I will see you soon.